Always. We ask the questions. What is needed in the world? Is that going to be? KwaZulu Natal, a region in today's eastern South Africa, surrounded by the Drakensberg Mountains and the Indian Ocean. It's home to one of the most powerful kingdoms in the African continent, the Zulu. The word Zulu means sky or heaven, and according to history, it was the name of the ancestor who founded the Zulu nation at the beginning of the 17th century. The then newly born nation lived in relative peace until the late 1800s, when British troops invaded Zulu territory and divided the land the Zulu never regained their independence. Today, it's estimated there are approximately 11 million Zulus living in South Africa. They account for about 22% of the population, but other smaller communities live in nearby countries, including Lesotho, Zimbabwe, Swaziland, Malawi, Botswana, and Mozambique. They all recognize one man as their king, Goodwill Zwelithini. He reigns under the traditional leadership clause of South Africa's Republican constitution. And although his role is largely ceremonial, he does represent the connection of the Zulu people with their past and their history. King Goodwill came to the throne when his father, King Cyprian, died in 1968 but he was not crowned until 1971 because he was forced to take refuge outside the kingdom as a result of assassination threats. Today, the king discusses the past, present and future of the Zulu nation in an unprecedented television interview. King Goodwill, who recently celebrated his 68th birthday, talks to Al Jazeera. Thank you, Your Majesty, for such an opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, uh, my brother. Uh, just to be given such an opportunity uh, to have an audience uh, with the Al Jazeera uh, uh, TV uh, programs. Your Majesty, let me take you back to history. Back in 1968, uh, and after you inherited the throne, uh, you took refuge to the island of St. Helena, that remote Atlantic island. Uh, would you uh, mind revealing the reasons why? I don't remember myself finding myself in uh, uh, St. Helena. Uh, it's only my great-grandfather, King Dinu Zulu, uh, who was in exile for 10 years uh, during the time when Union of South Africa used to be uh, the governing body of this country. Uh, and then he was released in uh, 1898. And then uh, when he was released, he had to be looked at as somebody who is actually a fighter against the government of the time. So I always wonder how such information came across that it was myself that was in uh, St. Helena. When my late father passed away in 1968, uh, I was still in the college by then. And then uh, the threats actually came, you know, just after my 21st birthday, uh, when they was about to have a cleansing time, uh, since my late father had passed away, King Cyprian. The cleansing by The who? cleansing uh, by the royal family. Okay. The cleansing is done in the royal family and the nation at large. So the information came across. And then one of my elder sisters take an option and my brother-in-law to secure me. And then 
I had to leave the kingdom out to other province. So where did you go, Your Majesty? Uh, I was just in South Africa, but in other province in Transvaal somewhere. Since the notion of globalization has been advancing for the last two decades, how do you see, sir, uh, the ways to reconcile the two notions, the notion of a one globalized uh, culture, in most cases a Western one, with the traditional, rich traditional cultures that are being threatened uh, to be extinct by this attack? Cultures of the Zulu nation has been living under threatened for years. Because during the time, King Kejwayo, after the Anglo-Zulu War, you know the history that uh, he was arrested for castle. After they have actually attacked Ulundi in 1879, after the Battle of Isanlwane, 1879, uh, January the 22nd. And then when the British came back on the 4th of July, burning down of Ulundi, as it was the capital city of the Zulu nation, where King Kejwayo was settled. And then after that, the Zulu nation have scattered. Not scattered from other parts, but they were infiltrated by certain policies and by certain people that instigated them to away with the king. But it wasn't easy from my people to object King Kejwayo as their king. That's where the cultures of the Zulu nation started, you know, to move sideways. So now, when it comes to my grandfather, some of my grand uncles, they've never had an opportunity to look back on the cultural values of the, of, of the Zulu nation. They were not even dressing up even Zulu attire. And then even to my uncles, during my late father's time, King Cyprian, Prince Mangosotu can support my statement. In 1954, that was the time they started to get things together, to make things work on cultural values with the attire. When the first time for opening of the statue in the tomb of King Shaga. So that's where you could have seen the Zulu people starting to come up with their own traditional attire and the royal family most. You have revived many of the traditions, the old traditions of that nation. Yet, uh, many of these traditions uh, have been subject of criticism and uh, the best case scenario have been <laughs> controversial. Why such controversy and criticism for reviving uh, such traditions? I feel shame and sorry. Especially the, the, the reed dance <laughs> ceremony no, no. and keeping up with the male circumcision. Well, I, I, I feel shame and sorry for those people that have got such a feeling. I'm sorry that it's, 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 it's some of our black people, you know, that have got such things. But as far as that is concerned, I don't think would be having so many people in this country if I've never revived some of the events. How and why? Because of HIV and AIDS pandemic. Because if you have heard Prince Bangosut Putelezi last evening uh, of uh, dinner on my birthday, he just mentioned that His Majesty 
have actually spoken about HIV and AIDS long before, two years before it was discovered. And then our king have prophesied about this disease. So now we appreciate what our king has been doing all these years. Even Dr. Lomo, the Minister of Health, do the, uh, said the same thing. So when it comes to this criticism, I'm not worried about it because I know when you are doing something good, there are some people that will just keep on criticizing it. Can but you explain to us, sir, how reviving the tradition, such as the reed dance ceremony, would serve as a raising awareness raising against AIDS? Culture is a unifying factor to any nation. It's just like a, it's just like a religion. If you think of a certain religion, you find unity. Even on cultural values, you find a sign of unity and peace within. So now, I looked at it in a very close eye. When God tells me about this disease coming, and I had to question myself, what am I going to do when such a disease is going to come? Because the disease it means it's going to be brought by the devil. And I wouldn't do this without my belief. How did you prophesize that disease before it came into existence or it was discovered? <laughs> well, if you are close to God, as I believe that God has brought us the Son, Jesus Christ, and then I need to, do, do, you know, when I pray, I've got that, you know, mind of listening and that ear of listening to God telling me something. And then I ask God, why, God, are you telling me this? What must I do to save your people and to save, save my people that you have just made me to lead them? So, you are the one to tell me. And then, when I go on praying, 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 waiting for the answer, and the answer came, your culture is the one that can actually bring all the women together. And then you cough it out the message that I've just given to you. To keep the virginity until marriage. Actually, virginity is not important. Virginity is for caring. And then the advice to the people that you could see that they are being weakened by men who cannot protect themselves. So to give them that strength, I thought I should bring the young ones because I know the devil spirit is targeting the youth in any country in the world. As you could see the way how the drugs are being scattered everywhere, they're not targeted to myself and you, who are old enough that you can just go for that, that you can just go for that. But our children, they are living under threat because there are some people who are just targeting to destroy the future nations of tomorrow. From what I see in the curricula in South African schools, there is the minimum uh, emphasis on history, and uh, namely the Zulu history. Why do you think uh, 
this thing about the lack of emphasis on history in general and the Zulu history in particular. And do you think something should be done in that respect? Um, I don't think we need to worry about uh, about uh, uh, you know the Zulu people only when it comes to this. The problem is sitting in the previous history which our government at the moment is not bringing the history into practice within our own educational institutions. The history that we are still sitting on top of is the history of Jan van Riebeek. It's not yet actually considered to be brought back into practice in our schools just to tell the real history and to remind, to, to remind our institutions to give a period of history as it used to be in the past. So now, it is not something that is facing the Zulu nation only. It faces all race groups in this country who will one day will find themselves being in a very difficult position, not to know where they come from. What helps us is that today, I know my history. When I stand before my people, I have to make sure that I remind them. Talking about the history of Zulu, there once, uh, uh, there, there was once talk about establishing an independent uh, kingdom of the Zulu that will uh, get together uh, and embrace the 11 million population of the Zulu in this country. Is this still a viable uh, uh, a possibility in the future? I, I don't think it is so, because when you talk in terms of Zulus, Zulus are scattered everywhere in any corner of the world, but they know where they come from and they know who is their king. So now, when we talk in terms of kingdom, my people still believe that they, they still got their own kingdom. Doesn't matter that we are living in the Republic of South Africa. They know who is their king. And as a major, player of unity and a custodian of all cultures and values of the Zulu people. My people still believe that their kingdom is still there. Because when there are some problems in the country, I always intervene and my people still listen to me. In your speech during your birthday ceremony, you uh, said a very telling uh, sentence when you said, and I'm quoting you, there's no palace without people. How, in light of this very telling phrase, how would you define your kingdom? Is it democratic or an absolute monarchy or something in between? Well, as I'm living in the Republic, the province where I am, I am the king of the people of KwaZulu Natal. The work that God has assigned me now is the work that is more than of the, the, the founder of the Zulu Nation, King Shaga, in 1816 to 2016. Now, as I'm living in a democratic country, the people of Wazulu Natal, they are looking at me as the king of all the people of Wazulu Natal. Why? Because I embrace all of them. I embrace even the different religious, religion people, Christians, Islamic Muslims, Islamic communities, and then uh, different uh, uh, African type of religions. 
that we have in this province, all those people are looking at me as their king. And the different race groups are looking at me as their king. And then to prove that, even during the time of opening of parliament of the province, to start before it starts to work, I'm the only monarch in South Africa that, uh, you know, uh, opens parliaments in this province and in South Africa. The president opens the judicial parliament. I'm opening the provincial parliament. So all political parties, they know, they accept me as their monarch. Even when it comes to violence, I take action in inviting all, politi all different political parties together to bring our heads together, and then I warn them. Talking about violence, you raised this issue of lack of security in this country uh, in your speech during your birthday ceremony. Uh, how, how do you see this problem, this serious problem, sir? And what do you think the reasons why for such lack of security? Is it because of lack of human resources, material resources, or is it because of lack of political will to fight uh, for At it? this point of time, you know, we're just going for local election, lo local election uh, uh, elections. And now, there are not so many political parties that are, are fighting against each other. You know, in the past, they used to fight against each other. But at this point of time, it's only one political party that is the governing body, political party government, that its party is the one that is fight in, in, in fighting within. Are you talking about the ANC? I'm talking about the ANC which is not nice. And then now, besides that, I think they are busy sorting that out. But the violence that I'm talking about is the violence that is so much eruptive, finding that there is some <coughs> properties that are being attacked. Like in other parts of South Africa where they are burning down of schools, burning down of uh, community halls, burning down on transport and all that. I'm not against people claiming what they claim and talk what they should talk about, but they need to bring their heads together. Last June and uh, during the, the holy months of the Muslim months mm. uh, of Ramadan, you visited, you made a, an unprecedented visit to the main mosque <laughs> in the city of Durban. And in, in your visit, you addressed the worshippers and uh, you included many important messages in your speech to the Muslim community yeah. in which one of these messages were let's defend our differences. What did you, sir, mean by let's defend our differences? The message that I've given across that we need to get together. to make sure that we create peace and to make our province with the Muslims to be a pilot project to all to talk about peace. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.